thatched roofed village, the home of Acadian farmers, men whose lives glided on like rivers that water the woodlands, darkened by shadows of earth, but reflecting an image of heaven. So asked Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in his epic 1847 poem, Evangeline, A Tale of Acadie. His answer was fittingly grim. Waste are those pleasant farms, and the farmers forever departed, scattered like dust and leaves. The story of the Acadians, the French colonists, who in 1606 established uh, themselves in present-day Nova Scotia, that is, prior to Jamestown, prior to Plymouth, warrants better understanding for several reasons. For one, this great upheaval, this movement, this attack on the French Acadians after almost 150 years of living there in Nova Scotia really qualifies as the first state-sponsored ethnic cleansing on the continent. Now in the early 1990s, the United Nations Security Council created a commission of experts to explain exactly what ethnic cleansing is, and here's how they de defined it. Ethnic cleansing is a purposeful policy designed by one ethnic or religious group to remove by violent and terror-inspiring means the civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from certain geographic areas. To a large extent, it is carried out in the name of misguided nationalism, historic grievances, and a powerful driving sense of revenge. This purpose appears to be the occupation of territory to the exclusion of the purged group or groups. The term definitely fits in this particular uh, case. The British expulsion of the Acadians was a question of policy. It was thought about and designed for years. It was authorized and advanced by the highest leadership uh, in England. It was conducted with ruthless efficiency in the effort to separate husband and wife and parents and children as the Acadians were torn from the land that they had, had settled, but then also scattered all the way from Nova Scotia, all the way down to Louisiana, so that their way of life was utterly eradicated. Why did this happen after almost 150 years of settlement of the French Acadians? Well, for one thing, there's the natural British and French antipathy. The British were the ones who took it away from people who had originally been French. There was also the fact that the Acadians flouted convention. They lived sort of outside the perimeter of state authority for a long time. They also flouted social convention by intermarrying with and living with the native Mi'kmaq. The Mi'kmaq were the native nation that already lived in the Nova Scotia region at the time. At the heart of the action, though, was the simple fact that they had created a wealthy, and prospering life, and the British had guns, and it was easier for the British to raid where it had been easier for the Acadians to trade. And so the British took what the Acadians had. This was a devastating event, obviously, for the Acadians, but it started a longer trend, a trend of ethnic cleansing that continued on the continent. When I say it was a devastating event, um, Approximately 55% of the Acadians lost their lives in the removal from this area as they were scattered all along the continent from Nova Scotia all the way down to Louisiana. It may have been the first of its kind, the state-sponsored action, but it certainly wasn't the last. In the following centuries, you see particularly in the 19th century in the era of Indian removal, the same process uh, done again by the state because it could, taking private property out of the hands of private individuals and moving it to other private individuals um, simply because the state had the power to do so. And it was in the state's interest to make sure that property was in the hands of its supporters and citizens. The removal era includes a number of military actions that relocated and decimated dozens of native nations. Perhaps the best known is the Cherokee Trail of Tears in 1838 and 1839, which cost the lives of somewhere between a quarter and a third of the entire Cherokee population. There's a couple of conclusions we can draw about this. The first is that the long tradition of state-sponsored theft 
removal and cultural obliteration that has existed in, in North America since this time, it's part of the fabric of U.S. history. In fact, it predates U.S. history. And the fact that the British had this by virtue of theft um, really starts the U.S. story in the colonial era with this kind of action. Though ethnic cleansing would reach its peak later in, in U.S. history, uh, it sort of begins the whole story. The unsettling fact of the, the scale and size of the action, the fact that it took place over really the entire continent when you think of how far the, the Acadians were scattered and that it wiped out over half of them, really speaks to the fact that the kind of frontier thesis we see out of Frederick Jackson Turner, the kind of manifest destiny we see out of uh, latter-day supporters of the notion of U.S. exceptionalism really doesn't apply in this case because in this example, in this particular issue, ethnic cleansing, the United States is not exceptional and even its colonial history is not exceptional. It is a part of a larger world trend of atrocities against human rights. There is a second reason that the Acadian story is important, and in some ways I think it's, it's the more important of the two reasons. Not only did it start a trend of ethnic cleansing, but it also marked an end to what could be an alternate history that could have developed. The Acadian example offers a different picture of how North America might have looked if this tragic event hadn't taken place. Over 150 years, the Acadians developed a culture based not on conflict and conquest, but on mutual respect and accommodation and interaction among different peoples. In, in other words, it was a, a culture based on trade and not raid. The Acadians interacted with, intermarried with the local Mi'kmaq shared their religion, they developed a, a, a syncretic religion that combined elements of both cultures. They developed a language that, that uh, combined elements from both cultures. And in fact, the name Acadia is partially taken from the French and partially taken from the Mi'kmaq. What's more, the peaceful Acadians grew wealthy because of their adherence to a policy of free trade across national and ethnic boundaries. They weren't special revolutionaries in any way, they were basically just semi-literate farmers, but they understood that they were on the border of imperial authority. They had, in other words, the um, area in which to move in a kind of autonomous way. And so they took advantage of this fact by offering free trade without all of the uh, inconvenience of tariffs and regulations that came with the mercantilist policies of either Britain or France. So they moved rum and they moved furs and food and finished products and all sorts of things uh, through their economy to various groups that they traded with and thus became very prosperous. With this prosperity grew an almost organic notion of individual rights. They realized that they were doing this for themselves, they were working and they were seeing the benefits of this, and so essentially they didn't recognize the right of any government to take their stuff that they were creating there. At different points in time over this 150 year period, the area was sometimes considered to be part of England and sometimes considered to be part of France, and they didn't really recognize either one. They insisted on a policy of neutrality uh, with either of those powers and other powers as well. They sidestepped officials who wanted them to state their allegiance either to Britain or to France, or to pay taxes to either one of those. In a sense, they were de facto revolutionaries ahead of their time. They weren't looking for independence. They didn't articulate it this way. They just wanted to be left alone in their peaceful homes, doing their peaceful things peacefully with all of the people they were interacting with. These unsophisticated people managed to articulate the belief that because they were doing this for themselves, they'd exercised rights, they had recognized their own liberty, that continuing to do so was their birthright and that other powers didn't have the authority to come in and take that away from them. 
by common law right, they recognized what they made was theirs. The same arguments would lead the British colonies in 1776 to declare independence from Great Britain. But as I say, they didn't push their independence, the Acadians. They were just looking to be left alone. The sad thing is, they weren't. In 1755, the British decided to accept the flourishing Acadian community no longer. They effectively destroyed this alternate vision of how North America could have unfolded, how its history could have been told. So a French community of up to 18,000 people intermarried with and part of also the local Mi'kmaq culture was forcibly removed and scattered, again, from Nova Scotia all the way down to Louisiana with the sole purpose of taking the property uh, that had been Acadian and redistributing it to, to British uh, individuals and also to eradicate the, the very way of life that they had developed so that literally they could not come back together anywhere else on the continent. What we, we have here then is proof that the North American story wasn't written in stone in 1492. It wasn't written in stone in 1607. There was a different way that the story could have gone if tolerance and trade uh, could lead to generations of peace and prosperity. If people had acted more like the French Acadians and less like the nationalistic British. I recommend John MacFarger's A Great and Noble Scheme as an excellent book on the subject if you would like to know more.